Good evening, good evening, all you lovely, wonderful people, all part of our family. Thank you for coming along this evening once again on this lovely Tuesday evening. Uh, give us a quick wave, give us a hands up if you can see and hear us. Ian, say hello. Hello, everybody. Hope you're Look well. At that. Hands are going up, so that's really good. Uh, welcome to our Open Door Show. Uh, my name's Richie Clapson, and uh, I'm here with the other half of Property CEO, Mr. Ian Child. It's great to have you here. And just in case this is your first time, and I'm sure for some of you it is, looking down some of the names, I don't recognize all of you, then let me tell you what you've let yourself in for. Uh, you're in for a bit of a treat, really. Our aim is to give you around 45 minutes of non-stop positivity. This is a positive zone, half full zone within these uh, four virtual walls, okay? So we don't have any negativity at all. And it's all set around the theme of business and the property development, isn't that right, Ian? Certainly is. Uh, Richie and I run a company called Property CEO and, and our day job is training people how to become successful small scale property developers. So uh, many people kind of quite like the idea of developing property, but they, they often worry it's going to be a bit risky, a bit complicated. Uh, and, and our job is to give them the support and the training that they need to be able to do it safely and, uh, of course, successfully. So uh, we, we also believe that kind of right now there's an amazing opportunity that sort of uh, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, when it comes to uh, particularly property development. And we think there, there's potentially a great opportunity there to create a lot of wealth for developers. So we kind of wanted to help people find out where that is uh, and see if development, development might be a, a good fit for them. Good stuff. And, uh, you know, at the moment, there's a, a global pandemic or we're at the back end of that, but we're going to head into a recession. So you know, if that wasn't enough. But the great thing is recessions, they create opportunities, but only for those that uh, are out there being proactive and seek them out right at the beginning, rather than wait for anyone else to uh, settle down and follow up. So um, anyway, we're going to be serving up some predictions. I'm sure we have guests, we have training, uh, but above all, we're going to have some fun doing it. So tonight we have a special guest on this evening. I'm really pleased and we're going to bring him on in a minute. We have a property lawyer on, Mr. Paul Sams. I'll give him a wonderful introduction in just a few minutes and hopefully he'll be joining us very shortly. But please put your questions in the chat box for Paul. Otherwise, it'll just be a, yeah, I've been evening here, 45 minutes of myself, Ian and Paul, just looking at the camera, waiting for questions. So please put questions in the chat box. This is your chance. And by the way, Paul's not going to charge you for the answers this evening. So this is the only chance you get to ask a lawyer, and a pretty good lawyer at that, uh, questions without having been charged. So good evening to all of those that are joining us this evening. I can never read out all the names, but Kate, Roma, Joe's on, Gavin's on, Michael's on, Jennifer's on, Andy's on, David's on, Richard's on, Andy's on. Trish is on. Hello, Trish. Speaking to Trish earlier today. So hello. How are you? Clive's on. Yvonne's on. I haven't spoke to you two today, but you never know. Maybe tomorrow. That's a whole other day. Daryl's on. Deal's on. So welcome to you. And a few comments in the chat box already, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael's half Italian, and he's actually put something in there, which I do know what it says. It's Italian of some description. It says something like Buno Sieria. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's uh, Italian or would I pronounce that right here? What do you think? Buona Sierra. Yeah, um, I suspect possibly not, but it's it's oh. it's marginally better than your last one. I think those Italian night classes are beginning to pay off. Um, but uh, yes, Buona Sierra, Michael. <laughs> Oh, you haven't I, heard the song. I, got that wrong. I do apologize, Michael. Anyway, Debs and Richard says a very good evening to you both. Smiley face. Very good evening to you, Debs and Richard mm. on two for the price of one. And Debs has put a comment in here. and I've no idea what this says, but I'm going to read it out. And I've not really read this yet, but it says need some fish tonight for brain power after a day of searching for hidden potential development sites, measuring them and seeing how many flats we could get. So sitting room is now office with ironing board as desk, as well as flip chart. So much fun. You need to get out more. Fantastic. Yes, you, need to, you need to get out more. Wow. Cool go. No, I, I quite like the idea of a fish supper. That really appeals. Oh. Anyway, uh, Andy says, evening, gents. Andy, evening to you. Charlotte says, good evening. Evening to you, Charlotte. And Gavin says, hello, chap. Sam Richard says, good evening. And uh, Trish says, hello, as well as Chris. And even Hazel says, good evening. It's great to join for my first open door session. Hazel, hello. I haven't spoken to you for some time. And welcome to your first open door session. Hopefully, you're going to enjoy this. So obviously you see other people joining as we are on. So welcome to you. If I've not mentioned your names, I do apologize. I see Rob's just joined. Hello, Rob. Welcome here. 
Anthony's just joined Ranjit Song from Property Investor News, although we don't like to mention Property Investor News more than a couple of times. So we won't be mentioning Property Investor News any more times today. OK, guys, questions in the chat box, please. And we will ask Paul those questions. But first of all, we ought to see if he is available. So, mm. uh, Paul, are you with us? Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Paul, could you switch your camera on for me? I can. Look at that. Good yeah. stuff. Paul, good evening. Can you give us a yeah. wave if you can hear and see Mr. Paul Sams for me, please? Give us a wave, please. If you can. Yes, they can. Uh, not you, Paul. Good. We can hear you. Oh, I'm slight waving. It's the Zoom thing. You've all got to wave when you're on a call no. these days just to prove not it. Yet. Not on this show. Not on this show. I've always done it on telephone as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, so look, welcome to uh, welcome to Paul. Uh, I've known Paul for um, well at least 10, 15 minutes now. So um, if not 10, 15 years, um, good friend of mine, uh, very experienced in what he does. Um, uh, but, but to be fair, he was the only one available this evening, and you guys wanted a lawyer on, and Paul was available, and he'd come at short notice, so you know he had to dress in a hurry. Some would say in the dark. Um, I'm not entirely sure. In fact, You're never even uh, in the dark Anthony if you wear this, says, my friend. You're never in the dark with this. You are. Anthony says colourful shirt, and Clive says dressed in full corporate attire. I see. Right. Excellent. Good stuff. That'd be the same as attire, then, wouldn't it? Yeah, so, actually, yes, and actually uh, Paul is um, one of the uh, uh, has been quite an influential factor in not some of my decision making recently, um, because Paul, you uh, went through the process of getting your family involved on the uh, the hair care front. Um, and how, how did that work out for you? Um, well, in the first month of lockdown, I decided that my hair was getting a bit long. So I asked one of my nine year old twin boys to cut my hair and the razor sort of gave up halfway across. So this bit was gone and that bit was still there. And, you know, something more important came along. The it so my good lady wife thank god um shaved it all off and then she had another go at the weekend because she's become a dab hand i think it was not last weekend the weekend before and she said are you sure this is the same setting as last time i went yeah yeah definitely the same setting and then i stood up and because I, I did socially distanced hairdressing outside in the garden i stood up and looked in the window and it was like oh dear that is slightly shorter than i thought it would be but the good news is unlike some people i know that should remain unmentioned it is growing back yes yes uh, i i think it's um it's I, i've learned a lot from your experience paul and not, um not necessary not necessary but anyway Ian, you could take a leaf out of paul's book and get your hair cut paul would you like just to give us a brief uh brief intro a bit of background uh to who you are what your company is and just broadly what you do just a couple of minutes Oh, well, I spend most of my day these days sort of, you know, playing football with the kids in the garden. That's what they want me to do, but it doesn't happen. Um, I am, um, I suppose the best way to put it, unexperienced, which is a coded word for old, because I've been doing it for a long time. Property lawyer, I'm a partner at Dutton Gregory Solicitors, which is a leading law firm on the South Coast. I myself, because I like saying this because it's true, I'm an internationally recognised multi-award winning published author with a new book due out at the end of this month all to do with COVID conveyancing, um, which I've co-authored with one of my colleagues, Louise Uphill, who's been dealing with the enfranchisement side. I specialise in residential property, residential development, a little bit of commercial work, um, and I also lecture other lawyers across the UK. I used to do that in person, but now, and actually for the past few years, in fact, have been lecturing via various video machinations that we have because the world is a much smaller place so i'm often beaming into people's offices to update them on the law so anyone that's had a solicitor i may well have trained them at that point so i apologize now if i gave them any duff information but all my stuff is perfect of course apart from perhaps my dress sense but that's what my wife says and what does she know what does she know i think you look fantastic this evening haircut shirt Thank what's you. not to like Excellent. So, uh, you know, Paul works all around the country. Uh, as you say, he's pretty well known. Uh, we know that. So uh, I'm sure he's going to better answer your question. So let's kick off. I've got a question in from Dan Paul. First question this evening. So, Dan, you're uh, at the top of the street. Good evening, Dan, to you. 
Um, Dan says, uh, how has the legal landscape changed for property development over recent years? Nice general question. Well, I remember, as some of you may remember, 2008. Before 2008, all the main banks were giving money to people like it was confetti. Um, high loan to sometimes 90% loan to value. They'd lend 90% against the land and 90% against the potential gross development price sometimes I saw. And it was happy days. And then a property developer I know who was very successful, all of a sudden he went from being geared in 2007 at 85% loan to value to being geared in 2009 at 145% loan to value because he made some bad deals. Um, and his great line, which will always stick with me, goes, well, I know I borrowed a lot of money, but the banks have got to take some responsibility for it. So I think that from a financial point of view, that's been the biggest change. Certainly in the past 10 years, the big banks don't want to lend on development and it's gone to the smaller banks. So your high street banks that you will all know, see advertising TV on there. Funding's become harder. Um, planning has become more creative, shall we say because before you always had to, some good things have happened. You know, permitted development, that's been an amazing thing. You've taken off this block, you didn't, before yep. you would have to get planning consent. Now you don't, depending on which area it's in. There have been changes to building regulations because everything's built to a higher standard. From a legal point of view, it's like anything. My profession charges sometimes by the minute, sometimes by the word, some firms in London charge by the second. And, that oh, hurry up, it, hurry up. To get. Yeah, yeah, it's free tonight. Don't worry, it's free tonight. Um, things, documents have become longer. Things have become more complicated as we've decided that there must be bigger problems. But, you know, the more things that we find that are potential issues, the more chances there are to find a solution. Um, and certainly development wise, there are a lot more solutions than they were before. Uh, you know, things that before would have been considered insurmountable in the law are now quite often sold by buying an insurance policy, yes. which no one ever claims on because there's never a claim. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Dan, hopefully that answers uh, your uh, your question. And well done for being straight out the blocks. Ian, do you want to pick up the next one for us? Yeah, well, we've had a few come in uh, that are kind of similar veins. I'll group them together. But the, the, the general gist is, is what are the, the biggest mistakes that you see first time developers make when it comes to kind of the legal side of things? Oh. Um, well, for starters, they tend to think that they're Laurie Barrett and that they can negotiate and they'll go, I'm doing loads of deals. Well, you might be in the future, but you haven't proven yourself. If Laurie Barrett called me up and said, will you do my conveyancing? I would have second thoughts about it because I'd be thinking, why is he calling me? Because he's got his own solicitors and he's had the donkey chairs um, and his helicopter and Sol Campbell as a son-in-law. And... I'd also be thinking, knowing the big corporates, this isn't just Barrett that I've said there, it's all the big corporates, it's all about getting the price down. And I think first time developers need a bit, they'll need more handholding. I've got a client at the minute who is a first time developer and he's needed a lot of handholding that he wouldn't have got if he'd gone to someone that was inexperienced as a lawyer and someone that wasn't charging him the right price. So I might appear expensive compared to what, you know, a corporate, uh, developers going to be paying per plot sale and per land acquisition but I like to think that I'm adding value to things and I always try to say to clients have you considered the best way of making money from this site because if they instruct me to buy it that's fine I'll buy it but you probably gathered I like to have my sale things just like I do with my dress sense and my haircut so I will act and I'll say to them I think this is a bad deal uh, some of my clients have acted for years they won't buy anything unless I tell them I think it's got a problem because if the one site they bought where I said, this is great, guys, there's no issues. They had to have a board meeting all the way. You know, it was in the pub at the time to uh, consider whether to buy it or not, because I hadn't said there was a problem. But I, I think first time developers just need to bear in mind that they've got to take all the advice they can get. And the most important thing, I'd say, not necessarily from a legal point of view, but from a practical point of view, is they might think it's worth X but they really need to go with what the valuers and the local agents are telling them it's worth. And X is quite often Y. And they won't like to hear that, but they need to work in that whatever they're hoping to get, that's an aspirational price. 
And when it comes to pricing, I've often had it with people who've got, say, four flats in a block. They've developed them. They've put in a really nice kitchen. They've put in a far too high spec bathroom as if they were going to live there rather than someone they're selling it to. And then they haven't had an offer in a week. So someone makes an offer on one of them and then they do it at a ridiculous price to get it sold. Well, that's the price they've then set for the rest of the site. Mm -hmm. the, the legal side, it tends to be that provided they've got, I'll just give them a list at start. Say, look, I need X, Y and Z certificates. I need you to provide them to me. I need to know who your funder is, is on buying something. Um, I need to know you're going to get your planning sorted. And I will warn them that it's not cheap to buy a site and check it's all fine. Because people often go, I had a guy the other day, he's an experienced property investor, but he's doing his first time development. And he said, well, yeah, I don't want searches, I'm buying it cash. I went, it's fine. I said, this is a rural location. Are you planning on putting services to it? Well, there's a house down the road. I said, well, there's a house down the road and that's got gas and electric. We hope it's got gas. It's certainly got electric, you can see lights on it. But has it actually got water? Has it got gas? Has it got electricity? Or are you going to have to be putting a septic tank in, which is a good few thousand pounds? Can you connect to main drainage? Are you going to get electricity supplied to it? And if you are, it's going to cost you a lot of money. That, those are the things I think people don't get from a lot of lawyers because they're just told, well, buy this field. And then they buy the field. And that there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. But I always think that you've got to try and add some value because it's our job to try and fill in the questions that they haven't asked. I like it. I think, I mean, hopefully that's answered. And as, as Ian said, he, he pulled together a number of questions. So he hasn't specifically mentioned your name, but hopefully that's answered that this evening. But I, I think, uh, as Paul said there, the interesting, you've got to listen to as many people as possible. You know, whether it's us training you, whether it's your, whether it's your lawyer, uh, you know, whether it's an agent, listen to everyone, you know, particularly people that's been around this industry a long time. And if they're going to tell you and advise you something, then it's definitely it's definitely worth taking on board. And as is as as as, as um, Paul says, you know, a lawyer that's going to give you added value and give you some of that advice, I think is terrific because you're right, a lot of them a lot of them won't. Brilliant, good question, and well uh, well put together in there. Pull those together. Um, uh, Hazel submitted a question. Uh, this came in the week. So by the way, guys, uh, if you know we've got a guest coming on, or even if we've not got a guest, you're more than welcome to submit questions in the week beforehand. Hazel submitted a question. I'm not sure which Hazel, but there is a Hazel on tonight, Hazel L. So I'm assuming this is your question. Uh, she said, I'd like some guidance, Paul, uh, around dissolving a limited company from a legal perspective when directors want different things. I hear a lot about JVs uh, and JVs not working out, but not much info how to approach that legally if and when it happens. So if you need to dissolve a company when directors want different things, how would they do that? Now, that's a big question. So I don't know what quick answer you can give us on that one. Um, well, if I take the JV first, JVs are a bit like marriage, um, the way I look at it, because you're, get, you're getting into bed, metaphorically, with someone else. And you just need to check that you all get on fine and they don't snore, because that could be the thing that ruins it. Although my wife claims that I snore, but she's just she's delusional. It doesn't happen. Um, so I'm all wary of going I don't know. Events. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> um, so I'm all wary of joint venture agreements, and I, I, you know, they're a good solution to lots of things when you've got people say someone's building it, someone's putting the land in to sort things out because it's a commercial agreement. But people need to be wary when it comes to dissolving a limited company. I'm always we say to people, yeah, you've got a company. If you want to dissolve it, that's fine. Does that company own any assets? Do you need to transfer the assets out of the company? Have you got shareholding? Have you got borrowing? Will it affect there? Because some banks say, we, you know, why did you dissolve this company? It can affect your future borrowing. It's very specific to the facts. More than happy for Hazel to email me directly, and I can if I can't answer it because it might be more of a company question, pass that on to someone in our corporate department. But the thing to bear in mind is that it might sometimes on these things, when I've seen people set up a company for a JV on a specific project, is that one of them invariably wants to carry it forwards. So the way to do that is for that, if there's two direct, one of them and assign their shares across to the other person for a price or not for a price, depending on how it's done. But it just be wary about shutting it down because when you shut things down, it's essentially you've killed it. And it's not always wise to kill everything. 
sometimes just stun it and see what happens. <laughs> it's like bringing up children, isn't it? Um, anyway, that I, I don't think we can say that actually, but I did. But there you go. Hazel, and I'm assuming that's Hazel L. You know who you are. Hopefully that's answered your question. And, and under, of course, it's your first time on the show here. And as Paul said, you can email him. Paul's going to give out some details at the end. So if you want to email him, mention that you uh, heard him on this show. And I'm sure he will give you priority treatment straight away. Ian, do you want to grab the next question for us? Yeah, I've got one in from Clive. And um, Clive asks, is there an advantage to using local solicitors slash legal teams as opposed to a national company that specializes in property? Um, well, I do work nationally and I do work locally, so I'm probably a hybrid of the two. The thing these days is that locally you can always say you can see your lawyer, but I've always worked on the basis that people can't necessarily drop in and see me at the drop of a hat because one, I'm busy with other people, and two, I might not actually be in the office. And at present, I've not been in the office for some time. And the way things are moving now, there are lots of law firms um, not necessarily mine, but lots of them that are not going to have offices. We're still planning on having an office, but we're not going to be working in the office every day. Um, I quite like being able to not wear business attire, um, although this is business attire, of course. I, I, I'm wearing my shorts and my sandals. I can, I've can. i got the flexibility of working at home that the other morning I did the domestic chores because I hung the washing out. I did it for the first time, I think, ever. So I'm making sure it's on video so that if ever my wife sees it, she'll just get more and more upset about the fact I went, but I hung the washing out yesterday. Um, I'd say national firms, you know, I'd like to think that my firm is a national firm now because we do work all over. If I've got a client up in Newcastle, I can see them because I can do a video conference. I spoke to someone I know the other day uh, at a weekend, did a, a Zoom call out to India, and it, it was this, he was in the room with me. The quality was that good. I think local solicitors sometimes have a knowledge about certain things in an area, and that's the one thing that you can't replace. So, for example, there are certain areas of Hampshire that are more salubrious than others. And if you're using, if someone came to me and said, look, I want to buy a property in Nottingham, it's in this area, for instance, there are areas of Nottingham I know now, just from personal experience, that are worth more than others. And you've got to have a feel for problems that can be specific to a particular area. For example, down in uh, Cornwall, you've got to do a tin mining search quite often because tin mines are prevalent. Tin mines are a problem because one, your property can fall into it, and two, arsenic comes from it, which is very handy for Miss Marple and Poirot novels, but not so much if you're living on top of it. The other thing to bear in mind, just using Cornwall, for example, is Mundic construction. A lot of people haven't come across it. Mundic essentially was when after World War II, there wasn't enough concrete. So they thought, what should we do to substitute the concrete? I know, we'll go down the beach and get some shingle and shove that in. And of course, that then tends to cause structural problems later on when it gets cold or hot because it's not designed for construction. Those things I've picked up um, because I'm sad and I like property and I've learned lots of things over the years that I don't forget that rarely come up. Now, a Cornish lawyer would know all about tin mines and Monday. Um, I don't live in Cornwall, I've been to it plenty of times, but I've dealt with lots of properties down there. Same as if you're a lawyer in Cheshire, you'll know about Cheshire brine searches in relation to salt. But Again, I know about that and I'm not there. So in short to that question, coming the long way around it, there are advantages to both. What you need to think about is the actual lawyer you're instructing, do they know what they're doing? And they could be in a local firm or they could be in a national firm, but it's really gonna come down to the individual because like property and like everything in life, it's all about the individual's knowledge, not necessarily the firm as a whole. Good stuff, good stuff. Thank you. Clive, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, the question you uh, that was asked by Hazel just now about dissolving the company, Hazel says, uh, yes, thank you. It was me, Hazel L. Uh, much appreciated, she says. So that's good. And Clive just put in, thanks for your answer. Great. So uh, well done. Uh, good stuff there. Right. Next question I've got here. Uh, let me just go back up is from Charlotte. And Charlotte says, um, question for the lawyer. That's you then, Paul. Question for the lawyer. She I'll says, find find it. yeah, see if you can find one, Paul. Uh, I want to separate the side land from my house. There is a restricted covenant that any structure has to be approved by the previous owner. They are in their 90s. Um, they are in their 90s. Dies this covenant. And 
oh, does the covenant die? Does the covenant end if they die? So basically, they want to separate a piece of land, but there's a covenant which says they're not allowed to do it without the previous owner's permission. They're in their 90s. They're about to shuffle off of this world. Does the covenant end if they die? Um, I'll give you a lawyer's answer to that. It depends. Um, more often than not, it won't die with them because it will pass to whoever their heirs and beneficiaries are, so their next of kin. Um, or they could bequeath it technically under a will, that's a bit difficult to do. It may be that the covenant is what's called personal to just to this 90 year old person, and that it's only they have the benefit of it, but that would be rare, but it does happen. I would say as a betting man, because I, I, I like a bit of a bet, um, hence that's why I like Vegas so much, but whether I'll see it in November where I've got booked or not, I don't know. I better do, otherwise my wife might kill me, I think. Um, I'd say there's probably a 70% chance from my experience that the covenant will continue on the land when that 90 year old passes away. But the easiest way to answer that is it, if she, Charlotte would like to send me a copy of that covenant via email, I can have a look at her uh, it for her and tell her. Excellent. Charlotte, there you go. Look at that. He's offering to have a look at that for you. So uh, you can by all means send that in. I don't know if he's going to charge you for that, but I'm sure it'd be reasonable if he did. But um, definitely, Charlotte, be worth having a look at. So you can uh, uh, pick that up. And I'm just scanning down various other ones. Have you got one ready to go straight away? Question? We've got one in from David uh, who asked, Paul, in probate and other cases, how easy is it for inheritors to prove they have power of attorney? Um. Well, in probate, you won't have power of attorney because power of attorney dies with the person that actually they might have had power of attorney for. If it's in relation to a property they've inherited and probate hasn't been issued, then it tends to be a case of common sense with the parties involved. But you won't be able to sell it until probate's been issued. It is possible in limited circumstances because I did it on a large country house last year. Um, which was several million, but only three bedrooms. I still to this day don't understand. The swimming pool was bigger than the actual house, uh, but it had a large section of the river in it, which had fishing rights, which seemed to add value. Not being a fisherman, I didn't understand it at all, but the agents... Uh, I understand that totally. Uh, Paul, well, I have a question for you. Have an, interme I mean, an intermediate question for you, Paul. Do you like fishing or not? Uh, I've never been fishing, so I can't comment either way. Could you imagine fishing is very boring? Yes. So, uh, you're breaking up, Richie. You can't, can't make out what you're saying there. Um, I rest so my case you, Paul. Please carry on, Paul. Um, it was possible to exchange contracts on something last year that I had where we didn't have the grant of probate, but we had enough evidence to show that the grant of probate was coming. But if it comes to a property that's going to be sold and someone's passed away, you're going to need a grant of probate if it was in one person's name or two people's name and they both have passed. So okay. Hopefully that answers the question. Fantastic. That was David, wasn't it? Ian, that, that was, was David. David. Yep. Good stuff. Charlotte says thank you for answering her question earlier. Charlotte, thank you. We are uh, pleased to help you out this evening. And Dave has instantly put thanks in the chat box. So Dave is obviously happy as well. Uh, Michael uh, has put a question in. Uh, dear PCEO, that's us. My question for Paul is as follows. He's very formal, isn't he, Michael? He says, when buying a block of four one bedroom flats complete with a freehold, how much should uh, one allow for splitting the titles later once the flats are refurbished and the leases are sold off? Equally, how much should the freehold, if retained, be valued at? So what's the value of a freehold for four one bedroom flats? How would he work that out? And, and how much should he allow for splitting the titles off? Um, if I deal with the title splitting first, because that's sort of easier in a way, uh, depending on how they want to deal with the freehold and how the flats are set up, I would set I would charge a setup fee, as I call it, for setting it all up at the start. That would be anywhere between seven hundred and fifty to fifteen hundred pounds, depending on the value and the time involved for setting it up. So we had a company set up to own the freehold if we needed to, getting managing agents to give us an idea about costs, with the idea to make it so it was a turnkey operation of here's a pack of information for a buyer. Off you go and deal with it. And then I'd look to charge about £500 per plot sale, then uh, on a basic level. So he's going to be looking at about three and a half thousand illegal fees for that. Okay. If it comes to the freehold, then I've got several contacts that will buy freeholds commercially 
and they will get involved before the flats are sold to put together a pack. So insurance, maintenance, make it all look pretty. So that the more professional it looks, the easier it is to sell. And a chap that I worked with many, many years ago when I had more hair and was thinner and probably had more formal dress sense, used to tell me, make it look pretty, Paul. He said, the prettier it is, the less the likely asked questions. On. This was before the internet was still in its infancy, I think. And he'd produce huge bundles of documents and send them to solicitors um, on the basis that they go after the first page. Well, this looks OK. I'm not reading it all. It will be OK. Uh, and it still works to this day, to some extent, depending on how you put it together. When it comes to valuing a freehold, it's a case of what your ground rent's going to be and how much someone's prepared to pay for it. Up until probably six years ago, uh, the maximum I got for a ground rent was 36 times the ground rent on a, an odd enough on a block of four. Things have changed since then because mortgage lenders have got concerns over how much the ground rent is. I would bore you with it with some technical problems if it's above 250 pounds or 0.1% of the value of the purchase price for some lenders. And so that multiple of 36 times the ground rent has come down into, it, last year it was about 15. Now I suspect it's gonna be around about somewhere between 10 and 15. It may drop further, but it might change because there's lots of concerns in the law that the politicians might get involved and ban ground rents. I can't see that happening, but, that's caused the commercial landlords to take a different view on what they would do before. But I certainly think it is worth, from a practical point of view, selling the freehold is so much easier than giving it to the tenants or hold it. If you want to hold on to it yourself and use it as a, for a portfolio, great. But I would always say never, ever give it to the buyers of the block. No, absolutely. Michael, hopefully that's answered your question. And I, I totally agree with that. You don't want to give it away because it's got a value. Um, and 10, 15 times, yeah, you know, even that is worth having, um, you know, where, where we get to, but it has slowly been coming down, you're right. We've just sold off a block of, uh, of a number of flats and we've held out uh, for ground rents uh, significantly more than 0.1% and they're over the 250. Um, and we've held out at 300 pound a unit and we've got it, which is fine. On another scheme, we've had a little bit more of a challenge and we've had to drop it uh, on, on some of those. So, yeah, interesting times with freehold. We always used to say when we've been talking to students, boys, the freehold is a bit of icing on the cake. Don't make the deal only work on the value of the freehold. If you can get yeah. somebody for freehold, it's a great, it's a really nice thing to have. Buy you a decent holiday or, or a, bit, a bit of a nice car, but it's not going to it's not going to make the deal work. Good stuff. Excellent. Michael, hopefully that's answered that. Ian, ready to go to another one? Yeah, we've got one in from Raj. Hello, A-team plus Paul, he says. Uh, well, oh, that's us, Paul. by the way, Paul. That's us. We're the A-team. You're just with us. I'm just the B-team, clearly. Clearly. The B-team. Uh, so, uh, Paul, from your experiences, could you please explain technical ways of delaying completion if waiting for funding for a project? Um, death's always a good one. A bit dramatic, but that, that's always one. Um, it depends if you've exchanged or not. If you're exchanged, then it's difficult. Um, at the moment, COVID-19 has opened up lots of options for people on delays because everyone seems to talk about COVID-19. And just to plug my new book, um, not that it's aimed at anyone other than lawyers, but I've tried to make it so it's just a laugh a minute with a tiny bit of law. When I got sort of one chapter in, I thought I'm, I said I had to uh, quote some law. I went, sorry, reader, I'm having to quote law just to give them a feel of what the book's really like. Um, COVID-19 has opened up these opportunities that people talk about um, to delay things, but it hasn't really. If you want to delay a transaction, the simple thing I always say is pick the phone up to the seller direct, not the solicitors, the seller direct and say, look, this is my situation. I want to buy it, but... And people will respect that because people accept there are problems. The worst thing to do is bury your head in the sand and hope for the best. It's all about communication. If you tell people there's a problem, it's like anything. If I will say to my guys at work, if there's a problem at work, just come and tell me there's a problem. And I won't shout at you. I, I, you know, I might be hacked off, but I'm not be that hacked off. I'd rather know now so I can try and fix it rather than wait till later on and, and with a property deal if you're getting to the point where you need to complete and you haven't got funding in place then it's much better to just say look i haven't got funding in place this is what i've done to do it it's not my fault i've done everything that i can obviously the thing is it is your fault because you knew it was coming along 
but circumstances might have changed it. And if you can just get them on board and speak to them, people are normally pretty reasonable because they might think they can go and get it sold to someone else, which they can. They might sell it for more money, which they can. But are they going to sell it to someone for more money quicker than you can get your finances in place? That's pretty difficult to do, particularly in this day and age where money is hard to come by. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, I'd just like to say um, it doesn't work at a property CEO. Um, if I make a mistake, Ian shouts at me. So it, that doesn't work in our There place, are people so. you can call about that. I, I'm going to, because I don't like it if he shouts at me. So listeners, you know, the property CEO team out there, please uh, help me. He's shouting. And Paul, are you saying that when I call, that they'll take him away? <laughs> it can be arranged for a price. Anything can be done for a price. And um, and good to have somebody else do a book plug on this show. Um, so ringing the changes a bit there, Rich. Yeah, when's your book out, Paul? Um, should be out. It's going to the publisher on Friday, so it should be out beginning of July. Good stuff. Fantastic. Right, we'll have to we'll have to get Paul back again. That's if the audience want you back, and then he'll wave a copy of his book in front of the camera. We occasionally I've got less do that. Paul. Shirts I can wear. We, we occasionally put our books in front of the camera if people haven't read them, but it's, you know, we don't do it all the time. We just do it every other show. Okay, Richard's question. Uh, Richard, good evening. Good evening, Richard. He says, uh, if there is a bankruptcy notice uh, on a property we might be looking at, does that expire when the person is released for bankruptcy? And in which case could it remain on the land registry documents, even if the official receiver has no interest anymore? Did you get that? Um. Uh, the simple answer is that they could remain on there if the person has been released from bankruptcy because they still might owe their creditors some money even though they've been released. But if they're buying that property, that notice should be removed. And it's something that any competence lister would just say, look, we want it removed. We want evidence it's going to be removed. It, it happens. Uh, bankruptcy is an option that people take. It, it's quite a, quite a sort of the last resort, I think. Um, it tends to be people that go bankrupt haven't don't own property most of the time, but people do do it. I know a lot of developers that have done it. I know some state agents that have done it. I've even known a financial advisor do it, which he's not a financial advisor anymore, which probably tells you everything you need to know. Um, but if that's on the title, it, it should be removed before you buy it, and it will disappear because the seller solicitor will have to get rid of it. You're, if you're buying it with a mortgage, then you would want it removed, and it's just a part of the course that it would dissipate and be removed for that reason excellent excellent so richard hopefully that's answered your question just a bit of feedback on a couple of others uh michael earlier when we're talking about splitting the um the the leases and um looking at the the uh, freehold value he says many thanks uh, for for that that's great paul uh and raj we were just talking to raj about the now what was raj's question remind me and you asked the one from raj uh, Raj was the, uh, he mentioned the A team, um, which you banged on about for a while. And then um, it's about, it's about uh, the technical ways of delaying completion. Oh, yeah. So Raj's follow up, Paul, which is, yeah, he says, better to be honest than, than, than deaf. Um, uh, thanks for enforcing my own thoughts. Honesty is the best policy. Well done, Raj. Good. I'm glad you, uh, you liked that answer and that's worked out. Right. Let's have a look. Another question up here. I just saw uh, from Maria here. So, Paisius, hi, Paul. If I find a plot to develop, how do I know that's the right price to pay for it? That's an interesting question for a, for a lawyer. I, I um, can answer that one as well in a minute, but you have a go first. Um, well, I always say to people, we don't give advice on value, but I'll tell people if I think it's too much. Because I've seen people get excited too much. Oh, it's this great site. It's just amazing. It's got great views. Yeah, but is that what it's worth? Because I've got someone at the minute that bought something. Um, well, it's complicated. I won't go into it too much. He paid £1.2 million for a site and he now can't get it to value up. And he's gone, but, but it is worth this. The valuation the other day said it was worth it. it was, well, once upon a time, you know, I weighed probably, well, once upon a time, I was much shorter than I am now and I was much thinner than I am now. And I'm not going to, well, I might lose the, the inches height wise when I get a bit older and I'm hoping I'll lose some weight at some point but it's unlikely I'm going to go back to the size I was when I was five years old and it's a bit like that with sites on prices you need to get a proper valuation from someone in the know a valuer that if it if they get it wrong you can sue them 
Um, with solicitors, we just put the prices in front of us unless we realise it's complete fraudulent, which you know no one really does that because it's too easy to see prices of things. But when it comes to plots, look at the local comparisons that are there, get some comparables, speak to a valuer and see, but don't get sucked in on things because you think it's going to be the dream because the reality is prices of land seem to be going up at the minute because of the COVID situation we've had and nitrates which hasn't gone away in Hampshire. That has pushed land values up because less land is coming to the market and it's all about supply and demand and that's why I'll stay here now and I might risk it a bit. I don't think that if we have this massive recession that the government have suggested that we may have, I like it, the Chancellor's talking it up, saying we have the worst recession in 300 years, and that's talking it up. Property prices, I am convinced, will remain relatively unaffected because we've still got a supply of money from the banks and we have a lack of supply of property. Yeah. And pure supply and demand will support that. But when it comes to plot prices, I would say just be careful on what you're paying and get an expert valuer to tell you that it is there or thereabouts. Maria, I'd add to that as well. And I think even more important than before you even get to that value point, you need to know what it's worth. OK, so as a developer, and if you don't know as a developer, that means you, you need to understand how to be a developer. Um, and I don't know because obviously, I don't know, Maria, you may well be a developer, but I'd say uh, if you understand how to analyze a deal, you're going to find out what that property or what that plot is worth to you. OK, it doesn't matter what a value is going to put on it. I'm not interested in that as a developer. I'm interested in what it's worth to me compared to what I want to do with it. And then when I'm going to put that into the marketplace, because it's not the value of that plot now. It's what it does for me and the gross development value of when I've uh, developed that and put it back into the marketplace. That's where you need to look at it from a developer's point of view and work your proper deal analysis. So you should have a deal analysis that will mean you never have to ask the lawyer. It's great if a lawyer gives you advice and saying, are you sure? Because that's another checkpoint. But actually, you know, and a value is going to value it. But a valuer could value, uh, you know, you could get someone like Savills in and says, yeah, this plot is worth X. But you're not intending to do X. You're intending to do this, this and this. And actually, it, it doesn't work. So it's really important really, that you understand from a developer's point of view what that's worth to you. OK, let's see if we can grab a couple of other questions. Um, uh, da, 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 da. OK, Danielle's put a question, in, but I think we probably answered that one. She says, as a developer, when building a small block of apartments, would you recommend keeping hold of the freehold or either splitting it or sharing the freehold to third party? What would you do? Danielle, hopefully we've answered that one when we were talking on freeholds earlier. So I do hope we are. Ian, have you got another one we can just throw in to see if we can get one or two other quick ones in? I know we're slightly over time. Uh, I've got one here from Anthony. Will a record of bankruptcy uh, petition in land registry, uh, no, sorry, in the land registry prevent the owner selling the property? Um, no, they just need to have consent from the trustee that is going to be removed. That's a simple answer to that one. Cool, okay. fantastic, that was great. And also a quick shout out, um, an apology to Daniel, um, who was referred to as Danielle. Oh, I can't even see properly then this evening. It's so, amazing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Pardeep said that. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Pardeep's got a question in there. See if I can pick this one up. This will be probably our last question because we'd like to try and get you away. Uh, Padeep says, hi, I'm currently completing on a land assembly on three titles, two pieces of land uh, and an HMO shop. Uh, does it make commercial sense for financing to combine them into one title or to keep them separate? So that's three titles, two pieces of land, uh, an HMO and a shop, it looks like. Um, that's one for the financial institutions to see what they would say. From a legal point of view, you know, we could do it three separate ones or amalgamate them into one. I tend to say keep them separate just from a legal point of view because you don't need to actually have them put together. It would be from a finance point of view what they would say. And I imagine that most finance companies don't mind as long as they've got a charge against all three bits of land. I don't think it should make much of a difference. Brilliant, brilliant. I'll tell you what, there's one very quick one here. Let's, put, let's slide this one in. It says, uh, I have a question for Paul from Gavin. Have you done any development yourself? Um, I, sorry, my wife and I have a portfolio of uh, residential properties, quite a small portfolio of smallish properties, because if they're small, they're always let. That's the theory anyway. 
and we own a freehold to a block of flats that we purchased and another one because they were good deals at the time um, but we haven't actually done any development yet one day we'll get round to it because my wife's a property lawyer as well so who better to do it than us that's what we keep saying but we have this massive expense um, that are called twin boys who are nine years old it, the one of the good things of lockdown is that i've not had to go and buy them any sodding shoes for a month um, or two because we've not been able to go to clark's um, and, and boost their share price some more so um we haven't done any development yet but we will be uh, i would say to people that have done that do development once they've done the first one it's very difficult for them to stop they'll want to do more and they'll learn from the errors they've made in the first one because everyone makes errors and things but it is a good way to make money and it is a good lifestyle to have i've got clients of mine that have had all sorts of backgrounds particularly one that i'm very close to who uh, had an it background and when i was talking to him yesterday just a few developments a year talking to him and he said i don't envy you and all the corporate you know what um, a word that began with b and ended with s with a ck and it and a couple of l's uh, so not allowed to swear um he said i don't envy you that at all paul and uh, you know he's got the lifestyle he's very happy with and he's making plenty of money so fair play to him Good stuff. Well, Gavin says, thank you, Paul. Thank you for sharing. Guys, did you enjoy that? Was it useful having Paul on? Give us a hands up if you enjoyed that, if you thought that was useful this evening. Good stuff. Good stuff. OK. And uh, would you like uh, us to see if Paul will come back at another time? I'm going to drop the hands, put them back up if you want Paul to come back at another time. Yes. Unfortunately, there is hands going up, unfortunately, Paul. You sound uh, gutted you... at that thought, Richie. Would you be? Would you come back and see us another time and answer some more questions on another show? Yeah, I'd be delighted to, sir. Delighted to. Great Fantastic. stuff. So and with your new, with your new book. Yes. Uh, yes. Hopefully, it should. Be. I've had the cover changed. That was the main thing. Um, the original cover was a lurid brown that looked like something else. So I asked right. them if they could change it to blue to match our corporate colours at work. Excellent. It's all in the marketing, isn't it? Well, so, it uh, is. I, 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 but the brown was a talking point for a while. Right. Excellent, but not, not sending the right message, you were thinking. I thought it was sending the wrong message. <laughs> Excellent, we look forward oh. to that. And then in terms of uh, people getting in touch with you and your good uh, your good firm, what's the best way of people reaching out to you? Uh, the easiest way to do it is if they call um, or email um, my email address, which I don't mind people having, it, you can get it from our website, but it's quite simple. It's p.sams, S-A-M-S, at Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N, Gregory, G R E G O R Y dot co dot UK. So P dot Sam's at Dutton Gregory dot co dot UK. Um, or give me a call, my number, which is 02380 213787. And that's straight through to me, assuming I'm not in a virtual meeting or something like this, which I do every once in a while. Um, but um, I will always get back to people. If they call me on the day, I will always endeavour to get back to them the same day. Unless I do get people that call me at seven o'clock at night. And I tend to sort of switch off at that point because my brain doesn't work particularly well after six. Paul, oh, can you um, throw that phone number out one more time? Of course, 02380 213787. Great stuff. Paul, thank you for coming on. Lots of uh, thanks coming in. So we're, we're going to bid you farewell and I'll speak to you soon, Paul. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Paul. Right. Thank you, sir. See ya. How good was that? He was good, wasn't he, Ian? It was very good. And that shirt and the haircut, the whole haircut and shirt thing was working for me. I think it could be the way to go. I feel slightly underdressed. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, we will get Paul back at another time uh, with a completely new, fresh, uh, outrageous shirt. So that'd be fantastic. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. Uh, we are just slightly over time, so I do apologise. But uh, we tried to get as many questions in as we could. I know we couldn't answer them all. There's a lot of you on here this evening. Uh, but hopefully uh, you've enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this episode of Open Door. Please, 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 if you've got friends out there and you want to invite them onto the show, if it's your first time, please invite someone else. If you've enjoyed it, uh, then please invite someone else along. We'd love to grow this community. We'd love to grow the uh, the family. Team CEO, as we often call you guys out there, you know, you're part of the family here. So uh, please uh, invite other people to join us. Uh, we, we do love that. And share us on social media. We're happy for you to do that. And uh, if you are interested, we have a Facebook group, which is business owners creating wealth through property development. Please look us up, connect with us on Facebook, and uh, we're more than happy to invite you into that. Um, anyway, that's it for tonight's show. Any final comments for you, Ian? Uh, 
No, thank you all for your questions, some great questions there. And we will be back on Saturday at 10 a.m. Very we much looking be. forward to that. Good stuff. So we look forward to seeing you Saturday. Look out for the announcements. We do have a guest coming in, but we're going to hold that in reserve just to, to get confirmation. And let us know your thanks. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, put it in the chat box and you're already doing it for even ask. David says, cheers. Uh, Gavin says, great session, chaps. Thank you very much. Nina says, a great insight to the potential pitfalls from a legal perspective. It was good, wasn't he, Nina? Hopefully you enjoyed that. Good night, guys. Thank you, says Richard. So he must be off the bed already. Blimey. Thanks, Richie and Ian. Oh, awesome shirt. Change. Oh, makes a change from blue check, says Joe. Look, there's no point taking the mick out of us. Thank we you, Ian thinking. and Richie. Very interesting. Have a great evening, says Trish. A good night, says Charlotte. And a good show, says Clive. Massive value, says Anthony. Good night to you all. Good night from myself. Ian, say good night. Good night. Okay. Bye.